Welcome to the Human Performance Outliers podcast with hosts Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. At Human Performance Outliers podcast, we dive into a wide range of topics revolving around health, nutrition, and physical fitness. If you enjoy our podcast, please consider visiting our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash HPO podcast. Please also consider subscribing to us on your favorite podcast listening platform. Now, on to our next topic. Zach, you want to start recording? Yeah, we're uh, good. Yeah. Well, I don't well, know. Do you guys want to do a bit of a, a heads up and a bit of a, a game plan for what we're going to cover? We'll just start talking. I mean, it's kind of fun. You know, we just kind of, uh, you know, I'll tell you, Paul, I saw a video you gave, uh, I think it was in low carb down under recently. And it was, it was, I know you did a couple, a couple talks and the one that really caught my eye was the one on fiber. Uh, as you may or may not know, particularly with me, I haven't had any fiber in my diet in about two years and I, and I haven't died, you know, and there's, there's, <laughs> from what I can tell, no negative effects whatsoever. And I've seen that, you know, time and time again with literally thousands of people now. And so I wanted to kind of get into that to, to start out with, and then we can see where, what, what road, what kind of path we, we get down, but let's get a little bit of your background information. I know you're a sports, you, you're, you're a sports medicine guy from yeah, Australia. Yeah. Or do, you, or do you know Gary Fetke? Are you, are you I, familiar I with actually, Gary? Yeah. Look, I chat to Gary quite often. Okay, yeah, because so, we had uh, Gary. I did a we, bit of Googling, and I see he's been on your program. Yeah, we had Gary on about a month ago. It was a great conversation. And, uh, I've actually just been downstairs. I'm upstairs at the moment at the hotel. I've just been chatting to Tim Noakes and Steve Finney. Ah, cool. And uh, I've come across with Peter Bruckner from Australia for this conference. Oh, okay, because we, we had we had uh, uh, Professor Noakes on uh, about two a week, a week and a half ago. Great great talk with him. So what, what conference are you at? Well, I'd say uh, I actually... Oh, well, let me have a look at my name tag. It'll tell me the name of it. <laughs> Emerging Science of Carbohydrate Restriction and Nutritional Ketosis, because that's not a mouthful at all. That's the name of the con- That's the name of the but conference. It's, uh, it's in Ohio, so uh, you know. I thought I'd. Uh, oh, so tell me if this is going to be uh, recorded or not, and I'll be careful about what I say. No, we're already re- <laughs> we're already recording. All right. Well, so uh, anyway, it's about a lovely it. place here. <laughs> is that at the at the university there? Or? Yeah, Ohio State. Okay, yeah, I it's think actually really nice grounds. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, rolling grasslands and looks like a, a nice place for an academic to reside. So you guys brought the whole southern hemisphere up, so that's nice to see. <laughs> yeah. So basically, well, look, I'm I'm a sports medicine doctor, and you know, I've got a personal background with metabolic disease. So you know, my blood pressure used to be 160, 180. A dyslipidemia like you would not believe and I was uh, you know I was a junior doctor I was exercising my tail off you, you know to be a doctor you need to be a little bit obsessive compulsive I have that tendency as you know and uh, I was doing everything right I was counting the milligrams of salt enough food and I was on a low-fat diet and just was not working and uh, you know, a little bit serendipitously I came across low carb it was actually a, an editorial written by Tim and Peter, and uh, I thought, ah, oh, you know, that, that can't quite be right, but an ad came on the TV, so I had a look at it, and uh, looked at the references, and I go, hey, these stack up, this is all decent research, so the next day I started, and that was about five years ago. Yeah, it's kind of funny when the results actually happen, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's kind of interesting, because a lot, of, you know, a lot of physicians, myself included, you know, came into this sort of thing the same way, you know, our health started to decline, and we're like, you know, we're, we're kind of doing the right thing. We're teaching our patients what to do, and it's not working for me. And then you kind of step outside the, the sort of the conventional uh, dogma box, and then and then you find out that wait a minute, this stuff works despite people telling you it shouldn't work. And so well, there's it's a very... bit of egg on the face as well because I used to be a physical therapist, we call them physios, and you know, people would come in. This is uh, you know, in the early 2000s, and I'd talk about this Atkins diet and. I'd totally poo-poo it and say, oh, you're killing yourself, cholesterol, you know, listen to me because I studied nutrition. And uh, it's time to sort of do a bit of a mea culpa at the moment, I think. Well, I mean, yeah, I think there's some people who are coming around to that, and there's there's more and more physicians every day that are that are sort of saying, wait a minute, you know, we, we, we had it wrong, we've had it wrong for, uh, you know, several generations of physicians probably, but there's, you know, obviously there's a, there's a huge industry that, and I mean, even, even me, I've just finished writing a chapter for a medical textbook on nutrition. 
and it ended up being 25,000 words of pain. But uh, I was trying to be as comprehensive as I could going through that and topics that you wouldn't think of. That's how I sort of got the idea of fiber because I was like, let's not just write about fiber. Let's do a bit of a dive in and, you know, go through the weeds and see what the research is. And, you know, I come up with that. Even uh, monounsaturated fats, you know, which we hold up as a paradigm of good health. It's like, well, they're not particularly bad for you, but there's no magical qualities about them either that would make them better than saturated fats. And everywhere you turn, there's, uh, you know, the amount of protein in the diet that we need to eat. You know, what the guidelines say and what the science says, they're worlds apart. Yeah, I think that's one of the things Nina Teichholz is trying to rectify, you know, get the, the guidelines to match what we know in, in, in science right now. And I think it's kind of, uh, it, it's it's sort of sad that there has to be someone that has to out there and, and push for that. But, uh, you know, speaking of monounsaturated fats and saturated fats, I heard a lecture by, uh, Dr. Mike Eves the other day, and he was talking about, you know, what's going on at the mitochondrial level with these different fats. And, you know, clearly was showing a pretty big advantage for, you know, I think steric acid, which was a type of saturated fat. And so that was something that uh, I thought was, was quite interesting. And so we, we have, I think I we really have a lot of work to do. I really think the saturated fats is where the science is at. And uh, even the research on trans fatty acids, uh, you know, We've got a very strong argument that they're bad for us, but if you actually have a look at the nuts and the bolts of the uh, the research, uh, it's really confusing. So if you have a look at the systematic review data, if it's trans fats from an industrial source, then they seem to not be so good for us. But if they're trans fats from a ruminant source, well, you know, that's a different kettle of fish. So it looks like they might actually be a little bit protective, but they're both trans fats. So... Yeah, the evidence is just, uh, we're still learning. Yeah, that's one thing, I, you know, I think the one, I think it's conjugated, conjugated linoleic acid, which is we see in the, in the, the trans fat that we see in the, in the, in the animal product and versus what we saw that was stuck in the McDonald's French fry vats, which was some sort of, you know, synthetic vegetable oil combination chemistry experiment. So, yeah, I think there's, you know, this is the thing we often hear from people that try to tell us how to eat that the science is settled. And I think that is, I mean, that's the most unscientific statement you can possibly make. You know, and, I, and I, well, the way I look at it is, you know, it's it's like a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle and we have about 10 pieces figured out. You know, there's a lot more there that, that you know, I, I think wow. as you'll, you'll see the more you learn about this stuff, the more you realize you don't know. And there's more that needs to be learned. Well, we were having some great conversation downstairs about the autoimmune effect of uh, plant foods. And I'll tell you what, the more you look into that, I mean, there's so much more that we're going to learn. And I, I think we're going to end up learning that uh, autoimmune conditions are, uh, are triggered by plant foods. Well, I mean, I, I certainly have seen enough anecdotal evidence out there that, that has me thinking that's certainly a possibility. And, you know, we had uh, a researcher, uh, another physician, Chaba Toth, from Hungary on uh, just earlier this week. And we went into what they're doing with intestinal permeability. You know, they're taking polyethylene glycol and they're administering it to people and, and then checking how much intestinal permeability they have. And they're seeing a direct effect on certain foods on intestinal permeability at the same time the intestinal permeability either declines or improves. We see changes in inflammatory markers like tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-6, and, 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 and to mirror that, we see improvements or, or, or you know, regression of autoimmune diseases. And so it's kind of like gut gets well, bad. Well, it's not inflation. even, it doesn't even have to be anecdotal evidence. I think there's, if you go through the, the data that's already there, we're, we can build a very strong case already. I mean, if we... Um, we all know about uh, gliadin, which is one of the uh, one of the parts of gluten, and how that interacts with zonulin and leads to basically the cells that line the uh, intestine, which you know very well. You you just have a slight narrowing or a separation of the gap junctions. Then you combine that with something called lectin, and we can see that that lectin is associated with so many autoimmune conditions. So I don't know if you've ever heard of what we call the thyrogastric cluster. Basically, it refers to the concept that if you've got one autoimmune condition within a certain, uh, a certain type, you're a sitting duck to develop other autoimmune conditions. And it really suggests that there's a common etiology between them. So the thyrogastric cluster is basically thyroid diseases, type 1 diabetes, pernicious anemia, 
celiac disease, uh, and there's a couple of others like uh, uh, vitiligo. And in the studies, so they've got human studies where they've biopsied the kidney, and they find that uh, uh, lectin uh, restriction in the diet reduces the amount of IJ deposition in an autoimmune disease called IJ nephropathy, which is the second most common cause of having a renal transplant. Uh, when you have people on uh, uh, animal models of type 1 diabetes, when they give them lectin, they're able to trigger the, uh, trigger the diabetes. When they actually have a look at what happens when you give lectin to the beta islet cells in the pancreas and the thyroid cells, they see it has a particular immune reaction which will lead the body to be able to attack itself. So that would explain your type 1 diabetes, that would explain your autoimmune thyroid diseases. So all of these are, um, I think there's a very strong case that can be made and it might be a little bit simplistic, but my understanding at the moment is you loosen the gap junctions with exposure to gliadin and then you allow some paracellular transport of the lectin um, into the systemic circulation and it goes wherever it wants to go off to the organs, it goes off to the kidneys, it goes off to the thyroid, it goes off to the pancreas. And you end up with all of these problems. Yeah, that is, uh, you know, and, and lectins are pretty much in all plants, which is one thing that's, you know, when you when you look at this, I mean, lectins are, you know, ubiquitous. And so you've got to say, well, what can I, what can I eat? What can I not eat? Um, just because there may be people that don't understand what gap junctions are, you know, we talk about the, the little things that bind this, you know, the cells are lined up, you know, between them, between each cell, there's junctions that, that kind of connect them together. And so when those separate, you have these kind of channels that you, you now have a, a route past those cells. So the cells aren't able to sort of sort of restrict what goes in and out past them. And so um, so let's talk about um, a little bit about fiber, because I know there. Well, let me just put it this way. We, we've been told that fiber is an essential part of the diet. There's an essential daily fiber requirement. You know, some people say it's like 15 grams a day or something like that. Some arbitrary yeah, number. It's considered um, one of the macronutrients by some. Right. And I, I, you know, again, I have my doubts about that. But, but you know, we look at, you know, maybe that came from Dr. Burkett, you know, uh, Burkett's lymphoma back in the 60s, looking at uh, uh, indigenous African tribes and seeing that they ate more fiber and, and therefore and postulated that it was required for health, uh, while discounting the fact that they weren't eating a bunch of sugar and other stuff. But so we've got this sort of notion that, that we have to have so much fiber in the diet. And, and you know, for things like you know, ease of digestion, ease of, you know, you know, bowel movements and stuff like that. But the literature, there's a lot of, a lot of contradictions with that. And I know you've talked about some of that in your talk, and I've, I've cited those articles as well. But the newest thing on the, the newest kid on the block is we have to have fiber to feed these microbiome, this, this microbiome mm. that if we, if we don't have this special microbiome that, that lives on fiber, all kinds of bad things are going to happen to us. And can you comment yeah. on, on why we think fiber is good for us, what the real evidence may show, and then what do we say to people that say, if you don't eat a bunch of fiber, all kinds of awful things are going to happen due to the microbiome being, uh, you know, upset. Well, it's the whole concept of fiber as a prebiotic where we need to nourish these certain bugs. And I think this is the major, the age-old mistake of cause and effect. Is it the chicken or the egg? And a lot of people are assuming that if we get a change in the gut microbiota, that then that leads to health benefits. And I think the, I mean, at the very least, we need to flip it on the head and say, well, is it possible that, you know, what we do that gives us a health benefit also confers a change in the gut microbiota? And there's incredibly strong evidence for that. I mean, notwithstanding, if you change your diet within 24 hours, you'll get a massive change in your gut microbiota. So you remember these bacteria, they, they multiply very quickly. They're absolutely prolific. So, you know, some of the E. coli's might have a half-life of 20 minutes. So, you know, within six hours, you're going to have millions and millions of them. And uh, I, what's actually happening is uh, if we look at anywhere in the body and we take a swab, we can predict what bacteria you're going to have. So that's basically because we know that up your nose, it's a moist environment and there's certain, there's oxygen and certain bacteria like that environment. And if we take a sample from inside your gastrointestinal tract, it'll be a certain type of bacteria that may or may not like air or, you know, in the back of your mouth. 
And that's because the environment we give to a bug will, will allow certain bugs to proliferate and other bugs in that same area to sort of be outcompeted, if you will. So just because we have bacteria of a certain type in our gut, it's much more likely to reflect the food that we feed them than it is to actually have any impact on our health. And I mean, that's not always the case because there are a couple of uh, a couple of examples where the bacteria can actually exert definite health effects. But by and large, our gut bacteria reflects what we eat and any health benefits that are associated with that are probably benefits from, you know, simply having a better diet. So the gut microbiome that is associated with reduced risk of diabetes, surprise, surprise, has very clear evidence that's also associated with lower blood sugar levels, lower HbA1c, lower fasting glucose. So, I mean, it's only logical. Anybody looking at it from the outside will say, well, it's clearly the diet that's having that effect on reducing diabetic risk. And yet some other people have come up and said, no, it's got to be the bacteria. Yeah, I mean, I think, and I've seen, uh, I can't remember who, who, who stated this, but basically the thought is a healthy, a healthy microbiome is whatever the microbiome you have when you're healthy. <laughs> you know? and, and, you know, it's kind of, uh, we, we have a lot of people that, that's, that, that's, you know, it's kind of putting the cart before the horse, but they're thinking that, you know, if I can just somehow impact my, my microbiome a certain way and direct it a certain way, it's going to automatically result in good health. And I think that's, I just think that's oh, backwards. That's, a perfect, that's an elegant, elegant way of putting it. I mean, we often talk about like, the Firmicutes versus Bacteroidetes ratio. Now, here's the thing. If you go to the literature and look at uh, the gut microbiome in epilepsics who have been managed on a ketogenic diet, you know what? They have that optimal ratio. They, they have that, and that's diet-induced. So, exactly. It's like your, your healthy gut microbiome is if you're healthy. But it doesn't sell as many self. <laughs> <laughs> well, and in actual fact, there's been some research recently. It was just published a, a week or two ago, actually talking about some of the gastrointestinal side effects that you get from a lot of probiotic supplementation. Yeah, now, I, I, I'm not a, I'm not a particular. I, for, first of all, I kind of question the efficacy of those things, and, and and two, I just, I just don't know, you know, if it makes sense to, to sort of, sort of almost mindlessly mess with our microbiome if there if there was a, something you could affect because again when i when i look at that you know i look at our knowledge around something like cholesterol i mean we've been studying cholesterol for how many decades now and we still haven't figured it out i mean we're still debating you know what it does in some cases if it's good if it's bad you know we don't we yeah. don't know all the ins and outs and now we've got a system that is probably you know 30 orders of magnitude more complex with the number of moving parts with all these different microorganisms in there and to say that we can somehow magically figure out what the right thing to be to me is is sort of the sort of the epitome of arrogance to think that we're going to go in there and drop something in there oh my god it, it is so complex the average adult has over 2000 individual species and by the way this comment that a lot of people make that you need a diverse microbiota for health you know what? That's never been shown. There's there's not one ounce of good quality empirical evidence that says that 3,000 bacteria is better than 1,000 bacteria. Yeah, Dr. Mason, and, that's what I was going to kind of ask you about was like, uh, you know, based on what you've said so far, am I oversimplifying by uh, assuming or saying like if you have a diet that um, – is working for you. And when I say working for you, I mean like you're, you see all the telltale signs of high energy, good sleep quality and all that, all those kind of like biofeedback things your body's going to give you. And it happens to be with a very, very like reduced. So like something, or I shouldn't say reduced, but specific, like the carnivore diet. Um, so is it oversimplifying to say like, if you're just eating that specific type of stuff, like just kind of like the bare minimum of what your body needs to, to be optimized, um, well, the, the gut bacteria is going to produce what it needs to digest those food groups. It's not going to, you know, have more in there's nothing to be, nothing for that to be fed. Um, well, let, let, let's look at it another way. I mean, and that is correct. I mean, you, you if you're healthy, you are healthy, mm -hmm. but it's probably even a better situation to not be feeding the bacteria too much, because if you've got a lot of food that's passing right through the gastrointestinal tract, getting down to the colon, then there's a lot of malabsorption going on. So, I mean, if we have a look at prebiotics like fiber or something like that, 
then the very principle of fiber is my definition of a malabsorption type syndrome. So uh, yeah. you don't, I don't think you want to, because let's have a, a think about this. If you feed the bacteria, they ferment the energy, the substrate you provide them, and they produce gas. Now, depending on whereabouts in the colon you produce your gas, that's going to be quite uncomfortable. That's the whole premise of bloating that we see with fiber. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, I don't think you necessarily want to nourish them as much. Uh, and if you do want to nourish them, then it's probably better to nourish them with undigested protein than it is to fiber. The reason being that the protein tends to get fermented right in the distal colon. So if there's gas that's produced, it doesn't bloat you so much and it's relatively easily passed. Whereas if you have fiber or something we call a FODMAP and that's in the proximal colon, you produce gas there, that's got a really tortuous course before it works its way out of your body. You're going to be quite bloated and uncomfortable for some time. Yeah, and you know, that's another thing I was going to ask about in relation to that is, you know, the big, I guess, argument for fiber and, you know, for any kind of non-energy based food source uh, is that you're cleaning out your pipes or it's passing through and people seem to be fixated on having this really quick transit system and that being an indication of health and yeah then they, they... i've never had a patient come to me and say <laughs> doctor I, it took me two days for this to go through from end to end in the elementary canal you know what they come and say it hurts it's bleeding mm -hmm. I, I have to strain to get it out it's really hard it, 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 they don't they complain of symptoms they don't complain of transit time. And the fascinating thing is that all the research, all the randomized controlled trial research done on fiber and gut health is essentially deflected to looking at transit time. And I suspect that's because that's the only thing that's actually been that they can get a, uh, I guess, quote unquote, a significant finding for. Because if you measure symptoms of constipation, bloating, bleeding, pain, straining, fiber makes them all worse. Yeah, and you know the other side of that too is uh, they'll look at like meat. If someone has a meat-heavy diet, and they say that meat goes through a lot slower, and that means it's rotting or you know like ruining your insides because of its slowness. And like it's like if you look at it from that side of the coin, that's one thing. But if you flip that coin over and say, is Ooh. it moving through slowly because your body realizes the nutrients in there are valuable and it's trying to extract all of them before it passes any waste that would be there through. And by jamming a bunch of fiber in there with it, are we essentially, are we essentially pushing those meat products through faster than what they would like to be there? Well, in their we can even state? look at it in another way and say, is there something else that, that uh, regulates gut motility and it, beyond just having something contained within the intestine? So, and that answer could be something called serotonin. So there's these cells in the, lining the intestine called the enterochromaffin cells that secrete serotonin. And that's hugely important in stimulating the muscles to what we call peristalsis, which is where it forces things along. And again, if we have a look at people with, uh, for instance, will uh, take celiac disease, if you measure somebody's circulating serotonin levels uh, with celiac disease then put them on a gluten-free diet, the serotonin levels actually increase significantly. So could it be that once you get rid of this uh, chronic irritation of the gut that the peristalsis will improve from that? And I mean, this is a bit of an aside, but we also then measure an increase in the serotonin in the cerebrospinal fluid of the people with celiac disease, which, you know, might potentially explain some of the mood effects. But uh, that's probably a bit of a di diversion. One of, the, one of the things, just, you know, because obviously, you know, people talk about, you know, fiber filling up your colon and causing you to, to, to have less transit time. But as you know, it's a, it's, it's a neuromuscular contraction. There has to be sort of a rhythmic, you know, synchronized contraction of the, of the gut. And, you know, we see a lot of people with peripheral neuropathy, and I just wonder how much sort of kind of, you know, splanchnic neuropathy we might have. You know, we have the splanchnic nervous system that kind of lines the gut. If that is infected in the same way by uh, glycation oh, or some of these I mean, we call that autonomic dysregulation. I mean, you're very familiar with it with diabetics. They have, they have uh, terrible troubles controlling their blood pressure. You are right. We stand up and we have an appropriate degree of, of vasoconstriction in our blood vessels to maintain our blood pressure. And that's regulated by the uh, peripheral nervous system. Um, so I, I think it's very possible. I mean, Nerves are very susceptible to glycation damage if you have uncontrolled blood sugar levels. If you have chronic gut inflammation and you're not absorbing B12, we know vitamin B12 deficiency causes a, 
uh, peripheral neuropathy is uh, several plausible causes that poor diet um, then could have further impact on gut motility. Yeah, I mean, I look, at the, you know, with the diabetics, with the obviously gastroparesis, which is, you know, basically paralysis of the, of the stomach itself doesn't move and contract very well. And so they end up with food sitting in their stomach for long periods of time. But, you know, I've seen, well, at least again, anecdotally, people with peripheral neuropathy improving those situations on a, on a low carb or a ketogenic or even as crazy as it is a carnivorous diet. Um and so I just wonder, you know, I would imagine the same pathophysiology except it exists, you know, with, with both the peripheral nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. And so it's kind of interesting to see how people recover gut function, you know, or at least mm. they seem to on these different diets. And so I think well, it's Well, the simple thing is, I mean, I mean, as I said in the lecture, you know, we know that fiber does actually bulk the stool. And if the problem is passing something through a small hole, is making that something bigger really the solution? It's really quite analogous to saying, okay, I've got a traffic jam. I'm going to add more cars. That'll fix it. It's totally illogical. Yeah, I mean, that is, and I'm sure you're familiar with some of the studies. I know there was a study, and I think it was 2014, I think, that Peary, Peary did on looking at uh, about 2,000 colonoscopy patients where she looked at this, she kind of, subdivide them into four groups of fiber, high fiber to low fiber. And the, and the group with the highest fiber had the most incidence of diverticular disease, yeah. which I think is just totally opposite of what we've been told. You know, uh, I've seen I a number have of patients people... come in on, uh, you know, saying they must have a quote unquote high roughage diet because they've got a history of diverticulosis. Now, uh, for those people, uh, you know, diverticulosis is basically if you imagine you're, you're in the intestine, you're inside a tunnel. And if you had an indentation in the wall, a little, a little pouch, if you will, where things could get caught along the way, that's what diverticulosis is. Now, I don't know why you'd be wanting to have roughage sitting around in that where it could get caught in those little diverticuli, but sure. Yeah, so I mean, again, but again, that goes contrary to, to probably some of what the, what the epidemiology would suggest because, you know, we have, you know, one of the big sort of problems we have is so much of what we sort of try to try to think we know about nutrition comes from this epidemiology stuff and i know gary Tal oh. was talking about it's just a con complete mess and, and and the fact that we try to almost use any of that data is is really harmful really and so i think we have all these uh, associational data and then there's and I, cherry picking so if well, you go course, to the yeah. main medical reference up to date and look at fiber you know they'll talk about it and they'll say yeah fiber is fiber is good fiber is good and then if you sort of dig down into the detail a little bit, they say, oh, except when we look at fiber from fruits, that's not as good as other fiber. And it's like, well, what do you mean? You can't have it both ways. It's either good for you or it's bad for you. Now, you and I both know that the, the fact that fiber from fruit looks like it doesn't do you any good and may actually do some harm is probably nothing to do with the fiber at all. It's due to the fruit within the sugar. But, I mean, that just really highlights the limitations of epidemiological research. Well, and there's people that, that sort of <laughs> their whole entire existence depends on that sort of, you know, that sort of epidemiology. Let me go back to oh, look, there's another topic, because I know in your in your lecture, you talked about and this is one of the things that the people that are proponents of fiber and the microbiome that when the microbiome interacts with fiber, they produce, you know, butyric acids and short chain fatty acids. And, and thus, that's why we need to have them around. But you, you went there and said. You know, and supposedly that has, you know, some sort of beneficial effect to possibly the enterocytes, the cells that line the intestines. But you, you said, well, you don't, you don't really need that because you can get that from fat in the diet anyway. So can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, well, basically, if you produce short chain fatty acids, they can actually be taken up by the, the cells that line the colon or the intestine. And then they get metabolized into ketones. And then the ketones are able to provide it with a source of energy. Now, this is actually really useful because we need a good mucus layer in the stomach. And we've shown that if you have enough, uh, enough energy substrate, then you're able to produce mucus and all the physiological functions of the, the clonocytes are able to be met. Now, but the point is here that it's the ketone that's giving the benefit, not the short chain fatty acid. The short chain fatty acid is an intermediary on the way to ketones. And if you're in nutritional ketosis, the extra benefit you get is that you get energy to every clonocyte. The problem with relying on short-chain fatty acids is that they're incredibly rapidly absorbed. And if they're, for, 
if there's ferment, bacterial fermentation at one particular location in the gut, that's where the short chain fatty acids are produced and that's where they're absorbed. Further downstream, you don't really have many short chain fatty acids to be taken up. So if you have, say, uh, fiber fermentation proximally in the colon and you have an ulcerative colitis, uh, inflammatory bowel disease or something like that predominantly affecting the distal colon, then that's going to offer you you know, negligible benefit, you'd be far better off being in nutritional ketosis. Yeah, I mean, clinically, that seems to be happening. You know, again, I, I just I just look at what I'm seeing with people with Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and even irritable bowel syndrome is when they drop fiber and go on a, you know, kind of a fatter, fattier diet, you know, meat heavy, those things seem to get dramatically better. And, that's, and that kind of lines up with that. Oh, that. it's... I mean, here's the thing. So I, I deal with a lot of people. Uh, I'm a sports medicine doctor. I see a lot of joint pain. They have what we call a seronegative spondylarthropathy. That's a fancy way of saying they have joint pain. Now, there's four main conditions that are associated with this kind of inflammatory joint pain. And one of them is what we call the entropathic class, which is inflammatory bowel disease. And that includes celiac, Crohn's, and ulcerative colitis. And it's very, very common. Somebody comes in with a joint pain, I'll ask them about their gut symptoms. And often they've had the symptoms so, low, so long they don't know that it's not normal. They don't know that they don't have to put up with it. And when you fix the gut, the joint pains disappear. Yeah, that is, again, that echoes what I'm seeing out there day, every single day. You know, I, as you probably know, I, I, I've been an advocate of this carnivorous diet, and I literally almost every single day have somebody with either rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, psoriatic arthritis, telling me their, their, their symptoms have gotten better. And often it's within weeks, and I think that is, I think that is truly phenomenal. And I, and I think, it, again, I think a lot of it does come from the gut, and so this is something that... Well, I always I, get excited. I have patients come in, and I, I, every time they come in, I, I do a refresh review on what medications they're taking. And I have to do it because often they come in, they've self-ceased, they're immune-modulating medication. These powerful medications that have significant side effects people say, oh, you know, I just felt like I didn't need it. Unprompted. It's quite amazing. Speaking of that, you know, one of the things we talked about with Chabatoth was, you know, again, with intestinal permeabilities, he found that a lot of the medications, in fact, were causing this disruption of the gap junctions as well. And so it's kind of, you know, you may be sort of cutting off your nose to spite your face by taking some of these medications, which only make the, the GI uh, component worse. And so... You know, depending on which drugs do it or not, I'm not sure. I'm sure there's a lot of work that could be done in that area. But, you know, I, I know you said, because I'm out here speculating, and I know Tim Noakes has talked about this, that maybe plants are causing uh, autoimmune disease and horror of horrors. How could you ever say that? You know, but yeah. at the same time, we've got we've got all these idiopathic diseases, and that just means we're too stupid to figure it out. But my, my answer to that is, well, maybe, you know, there there's something in a plant which has a whole bunch of chemicals. We like to point out the ones that are good. We like to look at the vitamins and antioxidants, and it's debatable whether they even work or not. But but we, we fail to, to realize that they have a whole bunch of other chemicals, you know, oxalates, salicylates, other things that potentially are bad. So we don't take a whole, the, the encounter of the whole I food. Mean, so these, I mean, we call these anti-nutrients, as you know. And I mean... Uh, they're incredibly relevant. I mean, you can go through each anti-nutrient in plant foods and you can identify the pathology, which as a doctor you will see in clinic related to that. So, I mean, if you, look, if you go to phytic acids, you know, so they bind to calcium, magnesium, copper, zinc. So quite often, you know, deficiencies. So especially in a vegetarian or a, a vegan, I mean, you know, they're they're sitting ducts for nutrient deficiencies. And where do you see the phytic acid? Well, it's in the holes of seeds and the nuts and the grains. And, uh, you know, it's even interesting. You can even talk about the environmental impacts of this. So, because, I mean, this is, uh, this is how plants for store phosphorus is in the, um, in the phytic acids. And if you're a ruminant, it's okay because you have a phytase enzyme. But if you're a non-ruminant, then uh, you can't uh, you can't basically absorb it, and there's a lot of phosphate that comes out in your manure. So if you're a, a swine or fowl or even fish now they feed grains, 
you end up with phosphate pollutions of waters. And this is a significant issue. So, uh, you know, pick another one. You've got your protease inhibitors. So, well, basically, uh, you know, there's this what we call a Bauman-Burke trypsin inhibitor, which you get in soybeans. So if you inhibit trypsin, then you're not going to be absorbing protein very well. And, you know, again, uh, these other uh, protease inhibitors, it's mainly in legumes and cereals. Um, you've got your uh, trypsinogen, which comes from the pancreas. Um, that's one of the main digestive enzymes. That'll get turned off. You've got your oxalic acid. Um, you see people with kidney stones. Terrible, painful condition. Whereabouts do you get your kidney stones from? Well, most of them are actually made from calcium oxalate. So if you have kidney stones, you shouldn't eat rhubarb. You shouldn't spinach, parsley. They're all very high in these things that are going to cause your stones. It's not the calcium which patients are often believe, and they go on you know, low dairy diets to try and eliminate the calcium. It's just crazy. I mean, you can go on. Yeah, I know, and I've looked through a lot of this stuff. We've had Dr. George Eat on. We've done this stuff, and I've done my own research on this. So, you know, but we have these, so we have all these chemicals we're eating, and, you know, they're natural pesticides. And, and if, if I were to say that some chemical company was spraying a bunch of pesticides on bananas and that was making people sick, everyone would say, okay, that's, no, no one would question that. Yeah. But if you were to say the plant makes its own chemical and it's making people sick, some people, all of a sudden people say, well, that can't be because we've been eating them for a long time. Well, I mean, there were no randomized control trials done when we adopted a grain-based agricultural system 10, 12,000 years ago. I mean, this stuff is just because we did it doesn't mean it's necessarily And not um, even that, it's even fruit. worse because we take some of these chemicals and then we tell people that they're healthy. We take flavonoids, you know, things like polyphenols. You know, so they're metabolites of plants and fungi. So they're things like tannins and stuff like that. So, you know, they inhibit your digestive enzymes. They'll precipitate proteins. They're really poorly absorbed, by the way. So less than 5% of them will be absorbed anyway. So if they did have antioxidant properties, they wouldn't do very well. And why are they there? Well, they've actually been shown to discourage herbivore consumption of different uh, of food. It's a protective mechanism. And so uh, exactly as you said, it's a toxin. And then we promote it as this health-giving substance. And it, it's simply not true. Well, a lot of people like to use the argument of hormesis. You know, it'll, it'll upregulate, you know, certain, you know, uh, enzymes in the liver, you know, and it's, it's, it makes us tougher. Uh, you know, and I make I use the analogy, well, we could all drink a little bit of gasoline every day. You know, it's a little bit toxic, but yeah. if we, 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 yeah. we would upregulate our capacity to deal with gasoline. The same thing we see with alcoholics, you know, with ethanol. You know, they, yeah, that's you know, a they, microsomal ethanol oxidizing system. It's like just because you force the body to deal with a toxin doesn't make it good. So, Dr. Mason, is that like that was kind of a question I was going to ask uh, if you had any thoughts on it is like, so what is what, what in your opinion is going on with some of these folks who seem to be thriving on like a vegan or a vegetarian diet? Or they just tend to be more robust in that world and that they can kind of handle some of those toxins at a much higher rate than someone who would, you know, who has the obvious signs of it not working for them and end up, you know, moving towards more of a kind of keto or paleolithic keto like carnivore style type of a nutrition plan well i mean they must be out there these people aren't in my clinics because the uh these people who when i do proper bloods on them they're always nutrient deficient they're not as healthy as they think they are but uh, there's certainly a genetic component so i mean it, it comes back we know it, the environment will interact with your genes and I think it must be just a genetic resilience so some people will be able to have the same exposures to a certain condition and not develop a disease, say a type 1 diabetes or something like that. So I, I suspect it's just purely genetics. Well, and often, you know, it's, I think a lot of people conflate youth with, with health because I mean, oh, yeah. you know, we, we look at, you know, we look at, you know, I mean, cause I always get these, you know, I get these people that send me pictures of these young vegan guys that are in shape and I'm like, well, that's great. But I mean, I can point to guys playing, you know, at the top level of, you know, in, in the United States, NFL football, and their diet is garbage. I mean, they, they live on Cokes and French fries, and they just have this, you know, it's just they've got this window of 10, 12 years where they're almost indestructible. And then what happens is, you know, time goes on, and, and, and you know, we all see what happens. Well, they, they youth tend and to exercise sick, sick. is remarkably protective. 
Right. Absolutely. I want to, you know, I just want to make a comment, you know, talking about some of these chemicals that we see in some of the plants, you know, I've seen that if someone has said that if a lot of these chemicals were, were introduced on the market today as drugs, they wouldn't get clear because they have too many damn side effects. <laughs> you know, can you, I mean, you, you can't imagine if we wanted to, if I wanted to say, I want to make oxalate a drug, you know, and, and, and administer it to the population, it, it would never get through because there's so many, like you said, problems with yeah, I mean, kidney, stones kidney stones and, and other things. That's probably a black box warning right there. Right. So it's, it's just, you know, again, we just have these food, we have these, these chemicals that are in foods that we have been eating for a few thousand years. And so we say, well, they, they haven't, they weren't acutely deadly for, for anybody. Then we're going to keep, we're just going to keep eating them and not question the fact that they might be leading to some kind of chronic issue. I know Bruce Ames did a paper in 1990 looking at, again, pesticides, and he found that something like 99.99% of all pesticides that human con humans consume are basically pesticides that the plants are producing themselves. That's and they crazy. kind of, and they looked at how many of them were carcinogens in animals. And they studied like 52 of them. 27 out of those 52 gave rats cancer, which, you know, <laughs> you know, and so it's, 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 you know, but because there's not the epidemiology that goes with that, you know, and, and I think, and I would argue there's some bias. I think the whole nutritional field is heavily slanted and biased towards, uh, you know, kind of a plant-based thing, considering that the American Dietetics Association is, I'm sure you'll know, listen to Gary Fetke was founded by yeah. basically vegetarians. And so we've got the same sort of level of mechanistic evidence minus the you know the problematic epidemiology and so it's not to say you're, you're going to eat a banana and, and get cancer but at the same time you know we have to look at what what's actually there what we actually know and, yeah exactly so well, I mean, what, it, and the logical extension of the anti-nutrients is then to say well let's look at the actual nutrients that are contained within plants and if you have a look at the omega-3 well they've done studies on omega-3 supplementation uh, plant sourced ALA versus your EPA or better yet your DHA and there's no comparison the conversion is less than 5% so if you're taking plant omega-3 it's useless and very similar with iron the form of iron you have in plant foods it's very hard to become iron sufficient if you have a look at the protein the protein is inferior quality and you know this belief that people have a plant foods as being nutritionally superior well, it's based on the flawed calculation. As you know, the, the league tables for ranking foods by their nutrient quality is actually, it has a, a numerator and a denominator. So they say, well, we've got the amount of nutrients on top, and then we'll divide it by the amount of fat, because fat is bad. So if you divide a, a number by a tiny number, you end up with a really big number. So there's all your vegetables right on top. And if you get something which actually genuinely has a lot of nutrition in it, like cheese or, you know, a nice fatty cut of meat, and you divide it, the, you know, whatever you put on the top, you divide it by all the fat, you end up with a much smaller number. So we end up with this ridiculous situation where people will consider a carrot to be healthier than a steak. Yeah, and, you, know, you know, and again, I just... to. We talk about vitamin A, you know, it's retinol versus beta carotene. We know there's issues with conversion with that as well from when the plant source versus the uh, the animal source. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's just even looking at, you know, we talk, you talked a little bit about, you know, anti uh, the uh, uh, anti proteases. And so there are, you know, there are studies looking at ileostomy patients where, you know, they looked at people, how they absorb animal protein versus a soy-based protein and we it's clear they see that what comes out at the end of the ileostium is much more undissolved un undigested soy protein compared to animal protein and so it may yeah. be those any any, any any proteases that uh, that uh, that do that and so it's it's kind of you know to see this it, all this information is already out there it's just trying to you know it's just trying to come at it from a different paradigm you know because i think mm -hmm. one of the problems i see with, with nutrition is it's like the answers are already known and all we're doing is going through the motions to confirm what we already believe. But when you, you know, when you turn it around and say, wait a minute, we've got some assumptions that we've made that aren't necessarily been tested, that haven't necessarily been tested. And then we can go back and look through the data and say, wait a minute, it's becoming more and more clear that maybe the opposite of what we've been told is actually more closer to the truth. 
And it, it's not just in one domain. It's the opposite in every domain. It's fiber. It's protein. It's fat. It's carbohydrate. It's salt. It's just about every mainstream recommendation that has been made in the last 30 years is in need of revision. Yeah, I would agree. <laughs> well, and some of that too, like I think one of the things that was more or less one of the kind of final straws in, in, in my like view of plant-based versus animal-based type of diet was, I mean, you don't have to look any further than like what you said, like how much is actually getting absorbed from that number that is in that, that, that thing. So like, like you, you said iron and I think spinach and steak are the perfect example because you look at like the iron content in spinach, you look at the iron content in steak, but then when you yeah. unpack how much of it actually gets taken up by your body, it's like, why am I putting something in my body that it can only, you know, extract part of versus something it can extract almost all of, uh, it, it's like you use a little common sense, I think, when it, with some of that stuff to kind of decide what are we actually meant to have in us and, and utilize as, an, as a nutrient from a nutrient standpoint. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. I mean, if we're not getting much out of it, then, you know, we, we look at nutrition in the, the wrong way now. We, it's a backwards. We should be looking at and saying, my body has this physiological need now what energy supply and what substrate and nutrient will best support that physiological functioning and instead we're sort of looking at it from this perspective of well let's try and get the energy in and energy out right so we come up with this flawed paradigm of calories in calories out and all of that and we, we sort of say well you know weight control is a, a good metric of uh, a healthy diet and sure that's true but it would be much purer if we didn't have to worry about weight control, as we don't have to on a ketogenic diet, and we're able to just focus on getting all the nutrients and the correct substrate to support our physiological function, because that would be the definition of good health. Well, and you know, that's the other thing I find really interesting too, is like our, our psychological view of food too. Like you'll, be, you'll talk to someone who will say, well, this, this, this item, this, this fatty cut of meat is, is really good for you. And they look, well, it's a very small item for that many calories. Like I shouldn't be eating that. <laughs> like I can eat this massive bowl of vegetables and get a fraction of the calories. And it's like, when did we decide that the more we can jam in, the better? Like you, you know, you can. Yeah. It. We've kind of lost connection with what satiety actually is. I think, and it's like just because it's bigger doesn't mean it's gonna be. It's gonna be more satiety inducing. <laughs> well, in my practice, so I mean, after we opened up our metabolic clinic. Um, it was probably uh, a while after I started expressly discouraging salads mm -hmm. uh, and partly because they're not satisfying so people just keep eating and two I think it just people if they're still wanting to eat salads they're still clinging to the low fat dogma yeah you know, in, uh, yeah I was just gonna say I know when I connected those dots in in myself a while back when I was you know I would I would be at the end of the day and be eating dinner and you know I would eat like you know a bunch of vegetables fibers vegetables and my stomach would be full but i'd have these hunger pangs and in my mind i was like this is this is counterintuitive this is not the way things should happen if my stomach is full my body should be not sending hunger signals or something's yeah. going on incorrectly and you know when you when you remove some of that stuff you can really start to kind of trust that fullness and that you you, know, you almost redefine what it is to feel satisfied versus feeling bloated or well it's actually hungry. I mean, that's tricky. And then we have our social inputs as well. So, hey, what time is it now? It's dinner time. Mm. Oh, I'm meeting up with a friend. I'm going for coffee. It's time to have a coffee and a bit of banana bread or something like that. <laughs> and so what I, what I do with my patients is I talk about the cheese test. And this actually came from my personal experience because I thought, yep, yeah, I'm a smart guy. I've, I've done this. I've, I've read a lot about this. I can figure this out. You know, I know when I'm hungry, right? You know what? I didn't. So I would get home and I'd, uh, I'd sit on the couch. And this is, I probably started uh, hitting the low carb thing a little bit before my wife did. Uh, I was certainly starting hitting it harder. So I think I'm hungry and I'd go up to the fridge and I'd, I'd see the salami and it's like, oh, I don't feel like that. And I'd see the cheese and it's like, nah, the cream. No. Nah. So I'd go through all these beautiful foods and I didn't feel like them. And then I'd find where my wife had hidden the ice cream. <laughs> Boom. I'd sit down and I'd smash a whole tub. Mm -hmm. And then I'd, I'd sit there and I'd ask myself, now, was I hungry? 
Now, if I was truly hungry, I would have eaten a tub of cream. I would have had some salami. I would have had some salmon. I would have had some cheese. And we've always got about half a dozen types of delicious cheeses in our fridge. And it's like I wasn't hungry. I was craving. And, I mean, this is the mesolimbic pathway. This is why artificial sweeteners are bad, irrespective of you know, the other effects, and we can talk all about them. But they, they reinforce this addictive eating. They reinforce the reward. They, you get this release of dopamine that reinforces the eating behavior. And it took me a long time to be able to distinguish when I was hungry and when I was craving. So for a period of time after that, when I thought I was hungry, I'd ask myself the question, would I eat cheese? And if the answer was yes, then I'm like, okay, I'm hungry, go and eat. And if the answer is no, and it's like, well, you don't want to eat cheese, this is probably a craving, you need to resist that. And sure enough, after several months, you know, the, the cravings disappeared. But it, it really took that, uh, I didn't have the insight into my own body that I thought I did. It was a real eye-opener. Yeah, I see the exact same thing with people on this, this kind of sort of carnivore, carnivorous diet. And, you know, we, we tell people, if a steak doesn't look, sound appealing, then you're not hungry. And, you know, and a lot of times as people are transitioning in, you know, and they, they are dealing with these cravings and they're dealing with this, you know, sugar addiction. Um, you know, I, and, and the thing is, if you go back to say, I'm going to eat a bunch of vegetables and lose weight. Well, what that just means is you're, you're constantly hungry because <laughs> you're not getting much nutrition. You're getting a bunch of fiber. You are full but you're not getting you're not getting much nourishment actually so you're constantly walking around hungry and so it's very yeah. easy to succumb to you know that that cupcake or that 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 the cookie that's sitting there because you know uh, you're just you're just constantly in a state of hunger but what we see is people that, that eat a lot of high quality animal foods is it's more satisfying uh, they don't over time they lose those cravings and I tell people just Eat, eat enough, you know, you become fully full, keep some extra on hand so then you do have a craving. If you're going to eat something, eat some more animal product. Yeah, and, and then exactly. after a period, of, And then after a period of, you know, again, a couple of weeks to a few months, all of a sudden you don't have those cravings anymore. And I think it's particularly uh, nice that you pointed out the thing about the artificial sweeteners because that is, that is something that a lot of people will say, I'll just put a little stevia and it won't hurt me. And I think for some people, not everyone, but for some people, that is a, a very difficult thing to let go of. And I think, it, you know, for me, what it, what it, it, even for me, even two years ago, I was still like I wanted to, to do all these keto desserts, and I really look forward to those things. But once I, once I took that out completely for a period of time, it got to where I no longer had any of those cravings anymore. Now I can take it or leave it. And, you know, it's, it's now where I'm, I'm in control of the food. The food is not control, in control of me, and I have more mm. choice. And even though I have a very, quote, unquote, restrictive diet, um, it's very freeing. So it's, it's almost the most freeing feeling you can have because you're no longer, you know, you're no longer subject to the to the what's yeah. out there socially and what what's what you're being bombarded with continuously. As as you know, we can't turn around. You can't go to the doctor's office and not see somebody bring in a plate of cookies or some candy. Or I go to the gas station, or I, I you know I went to the dump and they were handing out candy. I mean, I mean, it's just like it's it's amazing <laughs> where this stuff is everywhere. And so when you have this, no, you just no thanks. I don't want it. As before, whereas before, a few years ago, I would say, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll have that little thing just because, just because it's there. Even if I, even if I wasn't hungry, I'd still eat it. Oh man, you're you're just spot on. And uh, this is the thing that people cling to the most. I say, you can't eat bread. They're like, I love bread. Sure, you can't eat rice. Okay, you can't eat pasta. They why that? You can't have artificial sweetness. They just look at me and they're like, no, you did not just say that. And the, I, the only topic where I've actually regularly get into, you know, I guess what could tentatively be called arguments with patients is when they really resist my recommendation to go off artificial sweetness. And they're saying, oh, it's got no calories in it. And I say it will unconsciously change your eating behaviours. And they say, no, 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 it doesn't because I eat them and it doesn't change my eating behaviours. And it's like, how would you know? <laughs> uh, it's unconscious. Uh, you, you don't realise, sure, there's no calories in what you're eating now or drinking now, but it's going to lead you to overconsume later. That mesolimbic pathway is just reinforced. And I think one of the important things which you sort of alluded to just a moment ago is about providing an alternative option, healthy snacks. So one of the big lessons we learned from neuroscience is that these, uh, our behaviours, there are a series of neurons that are all connected together. 
and they sort of fire off in a particular pattern. And you can't change that pattern. You can't break a connection that's already be formed. This is why alcoholics, you know, if they have one drink 20 years later, they could relapse. The best you can do is to provide an alternative pathway and practice that enough so it supersedes the old one. So if you're used to snacking on uh, what we call in Australia Tim Tams, a chocolate biscuit, you need to then get in the habit of snacking on cheese or snacking on a salami. So, I mean, this is one thing I reinforce a lot with my patients is that you must have an alternate behaviour because you can never, you can't change the old behaviour. You just have to find a preferred behaviour that then over time will, will become stronger. And I think that's kind of why too, like when you have someone who's got like a drug addiction or an al- or is an alcohol, like you know sometimes the they'll turn to exercise and you know rather than you know going for the booze or the drugs, they go for a run or they go work out or something like that, and they kind of replace the negative behavior with um, assuming a a positive one. So it's almost like winning on both ends from that. Well, I, I spent a bit of time, uh, as a, I used to be a physio, and uh, I spent a bit of time at an Air Force base, which was quite isolated. And when I got there, they actually said to me, you're either going to become an alcoholic or an athlete, <laughs> because there's nothing else to do. So I, I think that's a really apt description, what you just said. Yeah. You know, and other thing, not to dive back, but look, the other thing I always kind of hear from time to time, too, when it comes to, like, just the regulation of hunger and satiety is, like... Um, you know, someone will say like, well, these people could be following a standard American diet and losing weight because it's all about calories in, calories out. They just have this poor misconception that it's good to be hungry once in a while. Like they, they start to identify hunger as a as kind of a win where like if I can make sure I'm hungry and not eat two or three times a day or whatever metric they decide to put on it, then that's the mm. ticket. And you know, when I think about that, it's like, well, why would I want to be hungry and not eat and, and, you know, constantly going through that cycle because, you know, my opinion is, you know, willpower is going to be kind of finite and, you know, that's why we kind of see some of this, this crash dieting, I guess, or maybe not crash dieting, but this like roller coaster ride where, you know, people will be spot on for six days, they'll be working a, a calorie deficit and losing weight and then all on the seventh day they go crazy and you know, eat the entire fridge. And, you know, so for me, it's like, I, I don't know where that came from, that whole like, well, you can't fight physiology. I mean, you know, we've evolved over millions of years. And if we were able to ignore hunger easily enough so that when it was raining outside the cave that you didn't really want to go and hunt down a saber-toothed tiger, well, you know, Darwin had a had a theory on that, didn't he? <laughs> so, you know, hunger as a physiological urge that you you really can't fight you can't win in the long term you can have short-term control of it but invariably if the pattern of eating that you have leads you being hungry you're going to lose and you know what causes these physiological urges well you know hormones for the large part i don't know if you've ever had a dog you know there's a certain time of the year where you know that dog is going to jump that fence and that's all hormone driven behavior uh, you know, we like to think that we're in control of our own destiny. And the simple fact is that we're, uh, we're hormonally driven animals for a large part of our lives. And, you know, if you have high insulin levels, if you, you know, develop leptin resistance, well, we know what the outcome's going to be. It doesn't matter if you're a type A personality, as diligent as you want, you can't beat physiology. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and another interesting thing I kind of re- realized like years ago when I first started kind of a high fat diet was uh, like at the end of the day, like around around dinner time, when I would actually start to feel hungry, it wasn't I, I didn't feel like I was running out of energy. It was like I almost felt like I had like a shot of caffeine. And I remember I, I can't remember who it was I asked about it and they were telling me like, well, yeah, that's because you're actually physiologically hungry. So your body is telling you go get food. It, you know it's still pretty pretty recent that you can easily get food. Whereas in the past, like if you got hungry enough, you'd want to go get food and you'd have to move quite a bit to get it. So it would make sense that your energies would upregulate as opposed to downregulate. Yeah, look, I haven't heard that, but I, I like it. It's an elegant theory. 
One of the things I like to, you know, you know, and again, I think we evolved a certain way, and I think, I think, like all animals, and I, and I can, and I, and I contend that human beings are animals, just like any other animal on the planet. You know, if you're eating your species-appropriate diet, then things tend to work pretty well, and I think your hunger signals. I mean, you know, for me, I, I eat basically one food over and over again, and and when I get hungry, I'm like, why would I have an appetite? I mean, what what else would there be for me to do besides eat? And, you know, and I eat and, you know, and I mean, you know, when you ask these people, I'm going to do a, a, you know, an extended fast. I said, well, what do you do when you get hungry? Well, I ignore that. And I'm saying, well, what's the point of your appetite? And no one has an answer for me for that. Yeah. Uh, just because I think it's so obvious. I think you're supposed to eat. Now, if you're not eating the right food, then then things are problematic. But when you're eating the right food, you eat when you're hungry and you don't get all these metabolic consequences, negative metabolic consequences. You stay at a relatively lean body weight. And that's what I've experienced I mean, I eat a ton of food, and I eat whenever I'm hungry, and I don't put on any weight. I mean, I eat, you know, regularly four or five thousand calories a day. I'm a 51 year old man. That's not the norm. And you know, I, I mean, great, I do a little bit of exercise, but it's not as much as you as some people believe. Uh, and so I, I ask these people, what, what's the purpose of an appetite? And no one ever tells me the answer because I think it's so obvious. Your body is saying. I need some kind of structural material, or I need some kind of energy, mm. and that's why you're that's why you're hungry. And what people don't realize is that our body is so finely tuned to tell us what you need. Often, if as long as it's not being overruled by addictive pathways. So the perfect example is in pregnancy with Pika. Are you familiar with this? Yeah, they want to eat dirt. Yeah. <laughs> they want to eat dirt. Now, why? Why on God's green earth? Is that a good idea? Because if they're uh, deficient in a particular mineral or something like that, and you can flip it on its head. So sure, uh, you know, we have these strong physiological urges telling us to eat things. That's why a lot of people, when they start off on keto, they crave salt because they don't realize the importance of salt replenishment. And, you know, I have a lot of patients coming in and tell me that they're, they're craving salt. It's like, there's your problem. The other side of the coin is, is there anything that we don't want to eat? Have you ever tried to get a kid to eat vegetables? Uh, yes. <laughs> you know, they, it, it doesn't come natural, does it? There's this, there's this natural resistance to eat vegetables. Now, I actually, if I think about it now, it's like, that's bloody logical. Why would you want to put those chemicals into your body? Well, I mean, we have a sense of bitter, and, and that was generally a warning, sir, because most of the plants out in the environment are actually acutely, will make us acutely ill. If you and I were to randomly start sampling plant leaves off the trees, we would we would very likely get very sick very quickly, yeah. and some of us might even die. So it's a warning signal that's built in for us. That's why we have that sense of bitterness. Now, we've bred some of those things down to where they're less toxic, and we can kind of get a little bit of nutrition from them. But, you know, we think about what human beings, or even if, well, I mean, human beings, I mean, Homo sapiens, we can, we can go back, you know, up to 300,000 years, arguably even a little farther back, and then human beings going back to, you know, roughly 3 million years ago, um, would have been, would have, would have had available to them, they would have not been eating leaves, because one, they taste bitter, they weren't bred anywhere near what they are now, and they're so low energy, there's no energy in those things, so why would anyone ever eat a leaf uh, you know, when you have this, these other options, which and isn't would be... it ironic now that we promote low calorie vegetables as a way to lose weight? We actually we encourage you to eat celery, or you know. Well, these... but but it works because you're starving yourself. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's I that's, mean, that's the um, bottom line. Yeah, I mean the idea is that we've so we've got the wrong paradigm of diets. We've got it so wrong now that we encourage people to eat these foods, which are really bereft of any kind of nutrition. Yeah, I mean, you know, again, I, I like to go back to this, you know, and, and again, there's people that don't believe we evolved and there was no evolution. But I mean, for, for the people that, that understand that that's likely what happened, I mean, you know, the, there wasn't somebody running around behind these guys, a dietitian waving some balanced diet protocol behind them. You know, they were going around looking for calories, you know, right. and probably protein. And, you know, what's going to give you the most bang for your buck from a calorie and protein source? It's going to be that big fat elephant. That you can kill with a spear easily, and this is interesting. We had a anthropologist, Mickey Bendora, on a couple of weeks ago, and he talked about the association between, particularly Homo erectus, who preceded Homo sapien. You know, you know, probably we probably probably we're just not sure, but we probably evolved at least partially from those guys. And they, everywhere they went, 
they found a prodigious amount of elephant, uh, you know, elephant fossils. And so they relied on those animals just because it was the easiest strategy there was. I mean, it, we, we, we've got data that these sort of modern indigenous tribes can kill an elephant with one or two hunters and, and a simple wooden spear. So that's all the technology you needed to get all, you had this all you can eat buffet. Yeah. And you've got all this access to this wonderful, huge fatty cuts of meat that would have lasted for months and months and because they would have dried it in the sun or they would have stuck it in the snow or they would have stuck it underwater like people have been doing and, for and thousands And they preferred years. the fatty cuts of meat. Right. I mean, of course they did. And that's why, uh, you know, because it's, it's energy. And so that's why I think, well, I don't know about you, but I know for me, when I see a ribeye steak, I, that is one of the most primitively satisfying things I can possibly do for myself. And I think that's why a lot of people are drawn to that. And I think a lot of people find that, you know, we need a certain amount of fat to fuel us. We need a certain amount of protein. You know, what that ratio was is debatable. Some people say it was 30, 35 percent protein. The rest was fat. But that's where I sit, and that's where I feel personally very, very good. And a lot of people that do what I do feel the same way. And, and your uh, body will tell you. Ex well, exactly. I think if you learn how to listen to it, and that's something that, you know, <laughs> we we have this obsession with. I got to take a lab test to tell me what what I should be able to look in the <laughs> mirror and see. And I, you know, I I've been criticized many times for saying that the lab tests don't tell you everything. You know, that as you know. They fluctuate daily. There are so many things that impact those things, particularly when we look at them in context of chronic disease. Certainly, there are there. If someone's sick, you know, they're coming to you and say, "Hey, I'm sick. I need to look at some things. There's some good, some stuff you can get out of that." And then, certainly in acute situations, uh, you know, you want to look at those things. But I mean, for a healthy person to walk in there and say, "Oh my gosh, my, you know, my 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 chloride level was one point out of normal. I need to I need to radically change my diet." I mean, to me, that's insanity. But we, I always laugh when I have patients come in and they they come in and say, "How are you feeling? Oh, I've lost 20 kilograms." And, oh yeah, how's your energy level? Oh great, I've got more energy. Are you sleeping well? I'm sleeping amazing. So how are you feeling? It's like, what's wrong? It's like, nothing. I feel great. Well, why are you here? I just need to do my blood test to make sure I'm healthy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I mean, we get that frequently because people, and invariably, they don't care about anything except for their LDL cholesterol, and they just want a lipid electrophoresis. Because um, usually they're semi-educated, and they're, they just want to know that they've got a good LDL profile. Well, and, and again, are, are, that's arguably debatable what that actually means. You know, and I know you're you're pretty well versed on that stuff. But I mean, it's it's this obsession with with sort of biohacking i think that you know with the tools that, that they don't understand very well which is always kind of amusing to me but we've got all these people out there commenting on this lab value and they've never examined the patient they've never talked to see what's going on they just you know you could put up you know it's like you could put up a number and say what does this mean and i'd say i have no clue i mean i'd, I'd want to know uh, you know 25 more things before i could even comment on that but you know anyway we had ted Naiman on here basically saying the same thing you know if you if you if you order a hundred hundred different labs you're probably going to get 10 out of normal, you know, probably well, I mean, on average. I, I have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, students and a few registrars come through and uh, I always try and teach them how to uh, interpret the blood results. And the thing that strikes out is uh, we go to the reference range to start with and it's like, this is a population-based reference range. This is not a healthful reference range. You can be healthy outside the reference range. You can be unhealthy inside the reference range. And a story that I really like is... Uh, uh, just to explain to people how arbitrary these reference ranges are, is in Australia, you know, back in the 80s, we had the, all the chlorofluorocarbons going around depleting the ozone layer, and we were very concerned about the sun. We still are too much. And we uh, told people to, you know, stay out of the sun, put on a hat, put on sunscreen, long sleeve shirt. And so this is the context, and then we noticed that this liver test called ALP, alkaline phosphatase, was going higher across the population. Now, I won't name names, but I, I was speaking to a, a senior uh, chemist at the time, and he was one of the doctors who was uh, involved in setting the reference ranges. So they got a room full of experts, and they said, what are we going to do about all this, uh, this raised ALP that we're seeing? So they thought the most appropriate thing was to do was to change the reference range. So they said, okay, all these ALPs, they're now normal. And then it wasn't until years later they realized that because of all this sun restriction that was going on at the time, everybody was vitamin D deficient, 
and they were picking up rickets and all osteomalacias and all these kind of things. But, you know, the arbitrary nature of it was that they couldn't explain it, they didn't understand it, therefore we'll just make that the new normal. And it was far from it. Yeah, I mean, I've looked into, like, the you know, some of the history in the RDAs, and, you know, I think in, in 2007 the Institute of Medicine had a conference, and they discussed RDAs, and they basically said the recommended daily allowances are based on the lowest level of evidence we have, which is merely expert opinion. So basically... I mean, somebody guessed. Some guy said, I think this is what it is, and that's what it is. And we have literally whole entire, you know, the, an entire field of, of science, you know, nutrition that based everything on these RDAs. And, and you know, yeah. again, who did they test? What tests did they do? I mean, you know, as I've said repeatedly, you know, I think the numbers are, are different for different populations depending on what they're eating and, 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 and among other things. But, I mean, we're An seeing... opinion is often consensus opinion. Right, And right. consensus it's... opinion means that you get the opinion of everybody in the room. And there's always going to be, you know, some smarter people and some not-so-smart people. So I'm sort of like saying, wouldn't one, you want to just get your advice off the smart people? Why do you want an average opinion? <laughs> you know? Yeah, so it's, but it's interesting that we have, you know, people talking about RDA of this and RDA of that. And you know, I, again, what I've seen in some of the research I've done, you know, things with like vitamin C requirements, you know, we, we see that, you know, animals will make their own, animals that have the capacity to make their own vitamin C, if they're presented with a low carb diet, guess what happens? They make less vitamin C because they don't need as much. So, mm. I mean, it's it's just, again, we, we have this. I mean, this, this is a perfect example of where logic, I mean, uh, where, what you're presenting is a falsifiable hypothesis. You know, it would be very easy to disprove what you said. There would only be one example of somebody on a meat-based diet who died of scurvy, right? And it doesn't happen. So, I mean, how we ignore this fact and then we create this fairy tale around the, the necessity of vitamin C in all circumstances. It's, uh, I don't understand how, you know, for such a smart species... Humans can be really stupid. Well, I mean, we have a lot of invest people invested with with theory, and and obviously there's there's uh, uh, you know there's a way that we we want, we we like this notion of a balanced diet. We like this notion of an eat the rainbow, eat your mm. what used to be five fruits and vegetables. Today, now people are pushing for ten fruits and vegetables because we have to have this <laughs> diversity of diet. And I look at a lot of other animals out there, and they eat the same old damn thing every day, and and to assume that humans have this requirement to eat all these different vitamins is because probably because what we're eating as a baseline is making us so damn deficient that we're scrambling to get everything in if we just were to to go back to something simple and i would argue a meat-based diet is the simplest thing there is that, that yeah. covers all the bases you know then you wouldn't have this this sort of need for diversity well, I, sort of, and, I think we need diversity of nutrients but the easy solution there is an egg so what i said if you get an egg and, you know, it's fertilized, you hatch it, you have a living animal. All the building blocks for that animal, you've got your musculoskeletal system with your bones and your muscles, circulatory system, heart, neuroendocrine system, all these building blocks are contained within the yolk. Now, the white, that's just waste, you know, that's protein, that's good for energy, but, you know, you get protein from lots of sources. But the egg yolk is nature's multivitamin. So just within the egg, you've got diversity of nutrients, and that's uh, the single, uh, I was actually, we've got one of our dietitians and we're chatting to her one day and I was telling her, you know, just push eggs on people and they'll be fine. She said, oh, no, 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 I'm not sure about that. So she went and looked up her uh, computer system. She came back to me and said, aha, uh-huh, it doesn't have enough vitamin C. It's <laughs> like, right. Well, if, uh, I'm sure you guys have had this discussion on your podcast before. I mean, you, you seem incredibly knowledgeable about it all. But, I mean, this whole thing about vitamin C, as you know, is uh, probably a little bit of a bridge too far. Well, so when are. she said that, I said, well, you can relax. The vitamin well, C and yeah. the scurvy thing is becoming kind of my indicator as to whether the person's actually genuinely interested in looking into the information versus just kind of pushing out some talking points. <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah, and you just have to go back. I mean, this is not new knowledge. You go back to the Napoleonic Wars. They used to eat horse meat, and that would fix their scurvy. 
you know, and obviously you've got to, you know, the sailors obviously were well aware of the benefits of fresh meat. So, you know, if they could have figured this out way back then, why are we still struggling with the concepts now? Well, you know, I, I scratch my head about that because I, you know, I sit there two years into this without a vegetable and fruit and, and I haven't had scurvy yet. And, and people still don't believe me that, that, that you're not going to get scurvy. So, and there's people I can point to that have been doing it for 20 years. And of course we can point out all kinds of historical populations that have done this. Well, you got Stephenson so. as well. So, I mean, right, he sure. came back and they said, we don't believe you, you know, you're lying. So I think that was under the auspices of the American Medical Association where, you know, they started out interring him and somebody else in a metabolic ward in the hospital, and then for the rest of the year, it might have even went for two years, they were measuring their ketones to make sure they were compliant. And uh, I'm paraphrasing the opening lines of their report, but uh, the first few sentences included something along the lines of, surprisingly, the two men remained in good health. <laughs> Yeah, we see a lot of those things with these surprisingly, you know, I saw a study on, you know, like, uh, it was something like, uh, they were looking at telomere length, and, you know, they were looking at different foods, how they affect the length of telomeres, which is, uh, some people argue it's associated with the cell aging, and they said, surprisingly, red meat was the only thing that protected against yeah. telomere shortening, shortening, so we always keep, we, we keep seeing these paradoxes and these, quote unquote, surprisingly, and at some point you have to start saying, well, maybe there's a reason this, this sort of recurrent theme kind of keeps happening. And so it's maybe it's not so surprising. And then we should... The problem is, though, when you have that, but then the findings are actually not even acknowledged. So the Women's Health Initiative is a classical case of that, where the only statistically significant finding, which was, uh, I don't, have you talked about this on your podcast before? Uh, I don't, I, well, I'll see what you go, see what you talk yeah, about. Yeah, so I... this is the world's most expensive study ever cost 700 million US dollars so they had about 50,000 females and they followed them for about eight years and one group they dropped their fat by about 10 percent so if there's ever going to be a study where you saw the benefits of restricting fat this would be the study now they only had one statistically significant finding it was not published in the results table it was not commented on in the discussion or in the conclusion and it was just a, a small statement on, I think it was page 661 of the journal. And it basically said the HR for the women with pre-existing CVD was 1.26, full stop. End of story, no more comment on it. And if you're not medically minded, then that means absolutely nothing. So this was the only statistically significant finding for the whole study, the only one that was not due to chance. And it showed that if you were a female with cardiovascular disease, and you went on a low-fat diet, your risk of having a problem like having a heart attack was 26% higher. So, I mean, that that's sort of bordering on academic misconduct. And then you have the uh, the press releases and all the, uh, the, the study coordinators then doing their interviews afterwards, and their conclusion, what they were stating to the press, which was then repeated, um, you know, massively was, well, this proves that reducing the fat by 10% wasn't enough. We need to aim for a 20% reduction in fat. And more recently is probably one that bothers me is, uh, uh, I think it was a pure study on sodium. And it had a very interesting thing. So what they found that they, uh, they had an inverse association with salt intake and all-cause mortality. And, okay, that's fair. We know this. We know that uh, reducing salt increases all-cause mortality. It's not the first study to show that. But then their conclusion was that, uh, and I'll actually read it out here. So our data suggests that a targeted approach in intervening in communities and countries with a high medium sodium intake um, might improve production of cardiovascular disease and strokes. Um, sure. So they're it might reduce cardiovascular disease and strokes. It's question might. This is ignoring the fact that they've already found that the opposite is true with all-cause mortality. And they justify saying that by such an approach would avoid diversion of resources to communities, um, et cetera, et cetera, um, in which, uh, and just moving on, and if the inverse associations between low sodium intake and increased rates of myocardial infarction and death are real, such a targeted strategy would minimize the potential for harm. So they've identified low salt is bad, 
then they've recommended a low salt intervention and said that we should only do this in limited populations so that we don't harm too many people. And this is a very recent, this is a big, big paper published very recently, and I can't get my head around the cognitive dissonance that somebody must have had to write that. It is entirely illogical. Well, I mean, I think people are married to their dogma and they're not going to they're not going to let it go. I don't remember who said that science advances one death at a time. And I think that's uh, uh, what, what we'll have Max to Max Planck. Max Planck. So. OK, yeah, thank you. And so it's it's uh, the way <laughs> some of this stuff is. But, I, you know, I, I think and, and I know you'll you'll talk with Tim Noakes and, and he, we talked about this with what, what you know, he likes to call the wisdom of the crowds or we call the democratization of medicine. We're seeing. Uh, more and more people with more and more access to information. And I think that is, is, is only a good thing. It's going to result in us learning a lot more, um, you know, in a more rapid fashion. And I think that's, that's I think that's, we're seeing the, the starts of that. And I think it's only going to continue to, to grow. Um, you know, I, I'm sure you're aware of a guy named, possibly Dave Feldman, who's, you know, he's showing that he can, if you're not, you should look him up. Um, he goes by. Yeah, no, Dave, no, I, Dave, I know yeah. if, I know if he's, I, I really, uh, what he's done has been beautifully elegant. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's like you know, if you can show, if you can show that your your cholesterol can can fluctuate a hundred points in a week, mm. and I'm going in once a year to get a cholesterol test. How do we know what I did that week? And you know, we make we're making these lifelong medication decisions based on stuff that, you know, if you were if you were to just by chance, you know, you had to reschedule your appointment two days later you would have gotten a different result. It really so, doesn't reflect very well on the medical profession that you can have somebody like him, and he, you know, he's a really smart guy. But you've had doctors working on this problem for how long who didn't figure out what he's figured out? Well, and he, the, the sad thing is he'll point out that they've, they've, known, they've known about the dynamic nature of cholesterol since probably the 1960s, and so they, they, they sort of knew that it happened, but they kind of swept it under the rug or it didn't, yeah. it didn't, it didn't match their... It didn't jive with the with the with the message they want to get out, and so therefore it was kind of pushed away. And uh, you know, it's how many people have been harmed in the interim? I don't know. I mean, it's it's shocking to think. Well, I mean, millions, literally. Uh, I don't know how much time we have left, but uh, I think we've actually uh, figured out the whole cholesterol thing. At the finally, at least in my head, I'm feeling comfortable that I understand it. Uh, looking at the results from my patients because I can do a lipid electrophoresis on every patient who walks in my door. So I've got literally hundreds of these results. And what we're actually, what we've figured out is with the help of some researchers from Japan is that it's glycation or attachment of sugar to the LDL particle, which is the important thing. So you've got these little proteins that stick out of the LDL capsule and they're susceptible to have sugars attached to them. And if a sugar attaches to that little protein, that slightly alters the size of the LDL particle, just tiny, just a tiny amount. And when you actually look at the descriptions of the big, fluffy, and small, dense LDL, they're actually not orders of magnitude apart. It's actually just a tiny little difference. And that difference is explained by glycation. And these Japanese researchers have demonstrated the size change in LDL particles that happens when these proteins on the outside become glycated. So number one, small dense LDL should probably be called glycated LDL. And then we have a look at what's glycated. So on the outside of this particle, you've got something we call an ApoB100 receptor. Now that receptor is like a name tag. Now it's going around in the circulation, it comes to the liver, you've got the bouncer at the door in the liver and says, okay, I know who you are, come back in, give us your load. Now, if you glycate that name tag, it's like putting a big cross or it gets to the bouncer, the bouncer says, nope, sorry, you're staying in the circulation, keep going around, keep going around. So if you have enough LDL particles get glycated, they can't get taken out of the circulation, they start to accumulate. So when we talk about LDL particle number being a much stronger predictor of issues, this is why their particle numbers accumulate secondary to glycation damage. Now, eventually, they have to get taken out of circulation. So how do they do that? Well, you've got these cells called macrophages. They're like little Pac-Men, and they can phagocytose these glycated LDL particles. And where do they take them? Well, they take them to the lining of the blood vessel because that's where that, you know, they're in the circulation. They've got nowhere else to go. And bang, that's the pathophysiology of your 
pathogenic plaques. So the way that you need to think about it is that you can eat as much saturated fats as you want, and that will make your LDL go high. But it's sugar that makes your LDL go bad. And I actually have a look and see if there's two peaks on the, on the graph when I have a look at the LDL. And if I see two peaks, I know you've got a healthy LDL population, and then you've got a glycated LDL population. And then there's one more peak. If you have three peaks, you're in a world of hurt because that's when the, the glycated LDL has begun to get oxidized. And that's, uh, that's another level again. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I, I think one thing, because I, I was very interested in blood sugar, believe me, um, learning about the fact that fructose is a, such a powerful agent for glycation is another thing that we seven we times that, stronger than glucose. Yeah, so I mean, it's you know we have these diets now that contain sucrose, which we know is a fructose and glucose molecule, and we get all this we get all this fructose plus what we get in high fructose corn syrup, which is even higher in fructose, and plus you know I guess you could make the argument about fruit because fruit is you know again fructose, and so we might have and I know Robert Lustig would probably chime in here. Uh, I've not had a chance to talk to him. Hopefully we'll be able to talk to him sometime. But we see that fructose, you know, becomes even more magnifying potentially in that in that regard as far as causing glycation, particularly, uh, yeah. you know, advanced glycation because there's there's simple glycation, which it can be reversible. I think I call them shift bases or amidoric products. And then we have this more advanced glycation that comes on it becomes more randomized and it's not as it's not a, it's not a stable construct and that's where these proteins really start to fall apart and I think you have these sort of damaged proteins and I think that's again something well, that the, the body would of recommend. The proteins underlies all the negative health effects of diabetes and the interesting thing is if you have a look at the tissues that are affected in diabetes they all have trouble regulating their exposure to sugar so the the cells that line the blood vessels they're exposed to it the eyes, they're exposed to it. The nerve sheaths, they're exposed to it. And these are all the tissues that, uh, that diabetics have complications with. And then there's one more thing which a lot of people don't realize. We talk about pancreatic burnout. So, you know, we, we describe it as though the pancreas gets exhausted like it's a little puppy dog that's just walked too far. But what actually happens is the beta islet cells uh, have an uncontrolled exposure to blood glucose levels as well, and they too are subject to glycation stress. And if you have advanced glycos glycated end products happening on the beta islet cells, they will start to fail. And that's why that uh, the pancreatic burnout is a late stage of diabetes after you've already had you know elevated blood sugars for a period of time. And by the time your pancreas burns out, you know you're pretty much stuffed. Except I've got some exciting findings. I had a patient uh, probably a first round two years ago, and he was on 100 units of insulin a day. And I just saw him a couple of weeks ago. And every time he comes in, one of the tests I do on these guys is called a, uh, a C-peptide, which is uh, because he was requiring so much insulin, um, we didn't really know how much insulin his body was secreting. So we did this from the get-go. And what we've seen is that on five consecutive blood tests since going low-carb, his pancreatic function is returning. So this, this pancreatic burnout, which you know, historically has been thought of as a permanent, irreversible condition, is reversing in somebody who used to take 100 units of insulin a day. Yeah, and again, that's, and, and Zach, just because C-peptide, when, when, when you make insulin, you make it, and then you cleave off this little part of it, and that's a C-peptide, so it kind of gives you a one-for-one -one ratio for how much insulin you're producing, and so that's why C-peptide can be measured as, a, as a basically a proxy for how much insulin you make, but back to when we talk with Chavitothin, he is seeing, you know, type 1 diabetic, which obviously this is an insulin production problem from the beta cells, and, and probably it's an autoimmune issue. He's seeing some of those patients actually you know, you're not needing insulin, you know, they, particularly if he catches them in the early few years when they've come into, you know, and whether it's a prolonged honeymoon phase or not, but he's mm. seeing that, that this this sort of what he calls a paleolithic ketogenic diet, which is basically meat and fat and organ meats, is pretty much stopping the advancement of, of type one diabetes in its tracks. And I'm not and I know he's got several patients that have been not on insulin for several years now. And I think that's pretty fascinating to see. And so to think the fact that maybe, you know, particularly with the type two people that have developed this I love some people call it LADA, where they where they have this latent autoimmune sort of type. Issue yeah, they respond, that will respond to the, uh, there's a class of medication that will fix those ones, the sulfonylurea. 
Right. So it's it's pretty interesting to see see this stuff coming out there. And so I just think it's just fascinating what we can do with nutrition. And, you know, again, I, when I look at all these diets out here, Paul, I mean, I look at all these different dietary schemes, you know, ketogenic diet where you, you try to get the macronutrients ratio. And then I then I just say, well, what was likely available to humans 50,000 years ago, which would have given me those macronutrient ratios? And I say, well, it's a big old mammoth. <laughs> and, and, and I mean, I think it's as simple as that sometimes. And so I love um, the rationality, uh, the way you approach it. It's just such a commonsensical, rational approach. And I mean, you know, you're bringing uh, you're bringing something back to medicine there. Well, I mean, I think we, we, we've kind of lost our way a little bit. We've gotten so clever with all these tests. And, you know, you think about it, Paul, when, you know, say your parents or even your grandparents you know, lived and arguably were no worse off from a chronic disease perspective than, than we are, probably were quite a bit worse off. You know, life expectancy may be a few years longer, but I mean, from a chronic disease uh, prevalence, we have more now. We have more sick people. They may live a little, a little longer but because we're prolonging their life. But we had we have orders of magnitude, more technology, more tests available to us. Ooh. And they didn't have that stuff. And, and they 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 arguably did better and so sometimes i ask why you know we have to keep adding things people think i'm going to add some supplements to the diet i'm going to add some magical berry from the from 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 the deep in the forest of the amazon it's going to somehow <laughs> you know make my health better and i'm just like maybe you shouldn't just be eating things that are that are that are potentially poisonous to you and you know it becomes very simple well if it wasn't for smoking we would never have ended up in this situation because the only reason modern medicine has managed to look good over the last 50 years is because we identified smoking was bad and we reduced smoking rates. If that wasn't there, then I suspect that the population, the life expectancy would have decreased in the last 50 years. Yeah, I would, I would, I would certainly echo that. I mean, you know, the, the fact that we had such a high prevalence of smoking and has come down, you know, I think, I think we've dropped smoking rates by... 70 percent or something like that over the last several decades and so it's it's amazing uh and, and that has such a huge predictive uh, a positive effect on health you know and this other thing about heart disease is a guy named malcolm kendrick that talks about that he thinks you know he, he looks at all the all the sort of vascular inflammatory you know problems that are out there and, and that and, and having a, a vasculopathy or an, you know like like lupus or something like that where you where that sometimes associated with it, drives your your risk for heart disease up like 20 fold and then you compare it to, a, to an elevated LDL which drives it up by you know 20 percent or ah. something ridiculous and so you know you have to look at this underlying inflammation and smoking is an irritant which obviously causes mm. inflammation uh, and then he talks about um, you know it's probably a clotting problem and you know we have this sort of issue with a procoagulant stuff and this is a this is a sort of a, a clot that, that and sort that of fits matures. very nicely with the omega-3 index so I, I, have you talked about that before? We haven't talked about it on the show. I'm, you know, I, I, I'm peripherally, you know, aware of it. You know, I know a lot of people are starting to test that now, and it's something that I think we probably don't have all the reference ranges we need yet. But I mean, I, it's clearly we eat too much omega six. We had Tucker Goodrich on here earlier, and we talked about the problems with the polyunsaturated fats, you know, the vegetable oils with the high omega six stuff, and that's causing and that leads directly all kinds into of coagulation. Problems as what you're just saying Malcolm Kendrick was talking about. So, I mean, the byproduct of the omega-6, we call it the eicosanoid pathway, is you go down to arachidonic acid, and then you end up with uh, what aspirin inhibitate, inhibits this enzyme, thromboxane A2. And, you know, that's a very, that pathway is very powerful coagulant. So if you can remove the omega-6 side of the equation, it's like you're taking an aspirin. Yeah, the other th the other thing is, you know, I think he points out that triglycerides are actually uh, a procoagulant. You know, if you have a high high levels of triglycerides, those are going to tend to cause more uh, coagulant, you know, uh, tendency to clot. And so, yeah. as we know, that sort of triglycerides are a proxy for carbohydrate consumption. You know, if we cut our carbs down, carbs Usually. out, we see triglycerides. Well, I'm sure you probably see that pattern in your patients. I know, for me, I, I my triglycerides are extremely low. My LDL is, you know marginally high but i'm very happy with that with that situation i don't have a problem with that but some people that are trapped in this sort of 1980s i don't even know if you want to call it the 1980s maybe 1970s <laughs> still and you know ldl has some immune functions as well you know ldl could actually be beneficial it's actually it's immune modulating 
Well, I mean, we see when we look at all cause of mortality, you know, particularly as we get older, we certainly see that low LDL is associated with with higher higher death rates of all causes, you know, cancer and uh, some of the uh, neurocognitive, you know, neurodegenerative type diseases. So I think, again, with this this sort of mad rush to to lower everybody's LDL. When I was in medical school, you know, I think about 20 years ago. I remember hearing the people, the, sort of the, 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 the attending physicians in the background talking about, you know, Lipitor, because this was a relatively new drug at the time, I think. And they were talking about this drug should be in the drinking water because well, everybody I had that in, has I had that in medical school. Yeah. I had that yeah. in medical school. Yeah. So it's, it's just this, this sort of rationale. And I think what's happened, that is more an indication of how effective a marketing job these drug companies have done that they have people believing that we should have a drug in our water that somehow humans have a drug deficiency you know and it, you know i've never seen a human that's, that's suffering from some drug deficiency i mean it just doesn't exist and so and but we it's have not this. just statins i mean we do it all over proton pump inhibitors are a case right. in point if we're talking about nutrients you know if you secrete the acid in your gut chronically it means that you can't really separate the vitamin B12 from the carrier molecule, the amino acid. You know, it's hard to absorb calcium. You end up with magnesium deficiency. You can end up with problems with iron. And this is a drug that we say that everybody should be on that's safe as houses. And it's just a coincidence that the standard dose of proton pump inhibitors is usually the amount that you can't stop without getting rebound side effects. So you can take a healthy person put them on a proton inhibitor for a month, take them off it, and they will get reflux. Hmm. It's a perfect drug. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a perfect drug for, for, yeah, for from making a commercial money. standpoint, perhaps. <laughs> Goodness. So, anyway, I, Paul, I tell you what, I don't want to keep you much longer. Uh, we, we appreciate it. It was a great discussion. Uh, you know, I, I hope you guys have a good time there in Ohio talking with everybody. Sounds like some neat folks are there with you. Um, you know, where where can people find you? Because, you know, I, I somebody sent me a YouTube video to watch because I know I'm interested in this stuff. And I watched it and I was really, really impressed with that. That's why I reached out to you. But um, how do people find you? Because this is such great, great information. I think we need to spread the word. Um, Zach and I are trying to do our part. Um, but the more people that are out there on social media making themselves well, accessible. Well, I, I actually didn't really helpful. mention that. But my business partner, who I set the clinic up with, is an orthopedic surgeon. Okay. So, uh, and he is, he is a great guy. I mean, there's, you know, there, there's a few of you guys getting around with yourself and um, Gary and uh, my business partner's name is Duran. And he was just bitching and moaning one day about how his patients couldn't lose weight. And he said, you know, you know, you put your elite athletes, you've got Olympic athletes on this diet. Would it work for my, my guys who can't lose weight to help their knee joints? And I'm like, sure it would. So we ended up starting this and we've got a website together. It's called Low Carb Doctors dot com dot au and uh you know hopefully by the time this is uh, uh this is being aired that we'll have our new website up so and we've got a bunch of reference material a bunch of lectures and that kind of stuff there so i practice in sydney in australia uh, i've got a couple of uh, locations where i practice so uh, you know you just look me up on the interweb and i'll be there but uh i'm trying to get around to a few more conferences now both learning and presenting so i'll uh probably a good chance of seeing me around the place wonderful hey awesome. let me do just just to touch on that because i know gary fetke you know got in a bunch of trouble for telling his patients not to eat sugar are you getting any backlash in from where you're at i mean i know is, Look, is there I'm, some sort of getting surprisingly little backlash uh, and i'm actually surprised i think probably gary went in and took most of the arrows um so the health regulation in australia is you know, got their hands slapped a little bit, so I think they're they're not going to try and deregister me or anything anytime soon. Um, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, I know there's a lot of dietitians out there who don't agree with me. Um, I guess I'm just in a fortunate position. They haven't complained about me yet. Uh, <laughs> I can't explain it, but I, I'm quite grateful. And I mean, for Duran, because Duran's an orthopedic surgeon, he actually. Uh, uh, you know, he, he makes sure he does everything right. You know, as you know, what we're saying, what we're talking about is evidence-based. And uh, we, we don't go off on a tangent. We don't, we don't steer away from the evidence. And I think that puts us in pretty good stead. Well, that's good to hear because uh, there's, there's a... <laughs> I mean, obviously, uh, you know, I, I know a little bit about your story and, uh, you know, 
I probably can't say on air what I really think about that, but I mean, <laughs> God, man. <laughs> Yeah, I, it's, I think it's I think it's eventually going to turn out in my favor. But it was it's been a uh, it's been an interesting it's been a it's been a it's been an enlightening uh, just to put a positive spin on it. It taught me a lot about the priorities of our healthcare system, and you know how we've kind of become a profession of a profession to a business. And I think that is unfortunate. Well, I have to say, I, I mean, if anything, it's given you a bit of notoriety. Now, I'll be honest. I actually, until you reached out, I uh, I wasn't aware of your podcast, but. I mentioned to a couple of people and, you know, it's almost like they wanted to slap me and they're like, you haven't heard of this guy. Oh, man. <laughs> so, I mean, your, your name precedes you um, and certainly even across in Australia. You, well, I a, think uh, sometimes it's preceded by a swear word or something, depending on who <laughs> you're talking to. But <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to wish what you've had, you know, on anybody. But it's certainly given you uh, a, a bit more of a platform to do the right thing. And well, and, and I think that's ultimately the good of this, you know, and I think we're, we, you know, this is the thing. I really see that, uh, you know, folks in the low carb world have sort of, you know, been in the background. And I think, I think we just have to step up a little, a little more because I think we're being directed towards this sort of plant based future, whether we like it or not. You know, we're, we're they're going to shove the fiber down our throats and sprinkle it in with some vitamin enhanced, uh, you know, soybeans. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know whether you know whether we want to or not. And that's what's going. That's what's going to happen. You know, they're going to suddenly, suddenly, it's going to be taxation. It's going to be these crazy things where, where companies stop paying for you to eat meat and so on and so forth. So we're already seeing it happen. So I, mm. I just think we just have to step up the game and say, wait a minute. And we had a very interesting guest on yesterday, Dr. Sarah Place, who works in the agricultural production. She's one of the leading researchers on you know animal agriculture sustainability and, and getting her intake. And learning about how to be better advocates for what we believe in as it affects, you know, because you and I can talk about the health aspects of it because that's where we're, we're from. But at the same time, being able to say, OK, but it's also not a problem for the environment. And here's why. And, and, and this is what we know. And I think that helps to yeah. sort of consolidate because the folks that are out there making films and, and showing little clips of horrible things. Uh, and, and trying to say that's that's how everything is are are, are basically you know doing a good job. I mean, I, I I don't you know I have to give them credit. They've been effective and very powerful in getting their message out. And I think that is something that you know the average person on the street that has no other sort of resources to go to is going to kind of go with that. And I think we're we're being uh, pushed one way by a very vocal minority. And uh, you know I think you know we have this sort of and again this is you know we have this sort of desire to keep be, be very inclusive and to be very respectful for all kinds of diversity with people you know we, we accept people that have different sexual orientations that's fine but when we start talking about diet you know there's this, this sort of thing that we're going to go there too because this minority says they want us to and i think at some point we have to say wait a minute we're human beings we're a species yeah. that evolved a certain way and we're not going to change you know who we are physiologically you, you and I, I think also uh, the elephant in the room here is the political undercurrents there's a lot of vested interest and i mean you know that that's that's very clear yeah and i think uh, like i said i think the uh <laughs> i think social media is going to be a great equalizer i think it is and it's continuing to be and, and you know i think the people that are criticizing you know i, I get criticism Almost seems like almost daily now, you know, from from people in this mainstream media, they get they get the sort of industry funder dietitian to come out there and, and spout their same stuff about saturated fat's going to kill you and blah, and you're going to get scurvy and blah blah blah. But at the same time, it brings more exposure, and then then, then that's when you have that opportunity to educate people. And that's I just what like I to do. compare research. You know, it's like, well, okay, all you have to do is show me one RCT that disproves my point. And usually the argument ends there. They they usually walk away. Yeah, I mean that's well, or they'll bring something else up, or or they'll say, well, it's bad for the environment, or or you're an evil person, or you know, <laughs> <laughs> live yeah. kindly, you know, eat a kind. You know, I, I have some vegan doctors that we I get into squabbles with on on you know, social media, and you know they talk well. You know, I'm I'm more kind than you because I have more kind diet. You know, your diet is mean oh. and stuff like that, and it's just like. You know, it's it's just it's it's almost comical at some point, but at the same time, you know, it's having an effect, and I I really worry about what choice my children will have. You know, if they if they want to eat a, you know, a nice, 
piece of meat if it's going to cost them, you know, an exorbitant amount and they can't afford it because of this stuff. So And vegetarians so. aren't that nutritious. Well, I would agree with that, but I mean, like I said, I think you should have. I think you should be allowed to have your own choice. If you want to eat that way, that's fine. You know, you just realize, you know, what what the limitations are, and if you're willing to accept that, that's fine. But don't try to force it on it on everybody else, because some of some of us find that human suffering is more important than than than, than animals, and it's not that we even treat animals badly. I think yeah. when you, when you really look at the way these animals are raised, they are raised in extremely humane fashion, far better than than they would they would fare in the wild, undoubtedly. And so, um, and anyway, here's the I'll, thing: the ethically raised animals are far more nutritious. They're, they're well, the kind of animals that that are good to eat. Well, I think you know, I think that's that's an interesting argument, and I know I, I've I've been on both sides of that argument. And I think there's a lot of data there that people should look at, and I think it's something it's a discussion we have to have because, you know, ultimately we still have to feed a lot of people. And, you know, it's, it's well, like... that's a big limitation, and I, I don't know the solution for that, yes. And I mean, but certainly from an individual perspective, um, if, if I have a patient come to me as an individual and say, doctor, I've got chronic health complaints, I can't walk, uh, fix me, then I know the diet that will help them. Now, you know, I, I don't know enough about the environmental impacts to be able to, uh, you know, intelligently comment on that, but... Uh, I do acknowledge that is a problem. Well, that's the thing. It's, it's, it's getting educated on that stuff, and that's what we're doing on the show. We've got several guests that, that they're in that field because that's the same thing. I'm a, I am not a farmer. I'm not a rancher. I'm not a, you know, I don't work in those industries. I have no real business commenting on that, and neither do most people that, that sit there and, and make comments. And so that's why we've, we've brought in some of the, I guess, and we brought in some of the, some of the experts in the field and, and, and let, let's get their perspective and learn what they say, because otherwise you're listening to, you know, Kip, Kip the vegan telling you on his film, you know, what, what, what you should think about the environment. And so anyway, well, and that's where it was good. I think you know, we had uh, Dr. Place on, like you mentioned, Sean, and you know, just to kind of get an idea of the scope of kind of where we are where we were at a couple decades ago versus where we're at now and what direction we can head if we focus on the right problems and look for a solution as opposed to kind of continue to muddy the water with kind of erroneous statistics. And, you know, when you really do take a look at it like that, you can see the efficiency of like meat production in the United States as well as like um, the quality of the animal's care and stuff improving a lot in relation to other areas in the world. So, it's, it should be less about targeting the United States and more about, you know, getting the rest of the world up to speed, I guess, in some of the stuff that we've been doing to kind of improve the efficiency. And, um, you know, like Sean said, I think, you know, we're not experts in that in that world. And we've been fortunate enough to have a have a couple folks with uh, um, Peter Ballerstad and then Dr. Place come on the show and hopefully more to kind of continue to shed light on kind of where we're at and where we need to head as as humans to make what's most healthy for us available to you know, whatever the population is. Uh, we, we must be able to come up with a solution. And that solution can't be eating a diet that will kill us prematurely. Well, even if it doesn't kill us prematurely, if it leaves us weak and disabled and, and we just kind of spend 30, year, 30 years being, you know, being cared for, yeah. and, you know, you know, because I, I, I see this cartoon Wally Wally and I see these people just kind of hovering around in their little floaty chairs drinking their, and sugary drink and being morbidly obese and you know you almost see that now with these people in the grocery store with their scooters yeah. and you know it's it's just we, we've gone on a dangerous path but uh anyway uh paul it was a pleasure talking to you um uh, let's maybe we can hook back up down the road because i think there's more i mean we it seems like we could talk for hours on this stuff <laughs> i think and we I, did we're gonna have to go uh, to the we'll three hour format know, pretty soon here yeah we're gonna we're gonna be the, we're gonna be on the we're gonna be on the joe rogan uh program soon you know it's sort of a schedule soon so anyway thanks a bunch paul and uh hopefully uh, thank you so much for having me it's uh yeah. i yeah. i love to chat this stuff it, you know yeah. i'm passionate about it and i see you guys are both passionate about it as well so you know that's uh i'm happy to come along for the ride absolutely we'll say hi to say hi to the crew say hi to professor noakes and the rest of the folks out there for us and uh hopefully we'll get to talk to you uh, live in person in in, in the near future yeah, well, we're having a few conferences in Australia later this year, so, uh, you know, I'm sure we can line up a speaker slot. Well, we'll see what happens anyway. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>
It's an absolute pleasure to meet you guys, even if online. Take That's care, right. Dr. Mason. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with hosts Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. If you enjoyed the show, please consider following us on social media and checking out our websites. Links to those can be found in the show notes. Also, if you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to shoot us an email at hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning into the show.